Bodies, 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 the 2022 horror comedy. In this video, we will be diving straight into its deeper themes and symbolism. It's a journey that will take us to some deeply disturbing places. But beyond all that, there's something else. There's... Yeah. The film begins with two lovers, Sophie and B. They get in their car and drive to the home of Sophie's best friend, David. Many horror films begin with a journey like this. It represents the move away from normal life and into the unknown, away from peace and into chaos. Although the chaos in this film is uncomfortably familiar. Sophie makes her way to the outdoor pool to greet David and his other guests. They're underwater, trying to hold their breath for as long as possible. They look up and see Sophie looking down at them, her image distorted by the water. This is a recurring motif in the film, the idea of a barrier that separates one character from the others. There is the party, the place where the friends are gathered, and there is the lone exile trapped outside the party, whether they want it or not. And this is the first example of that in the film. Sophie has shown up, but not everyone wants her here. There's something bubbling beneath the surface, literally. What they don't take issue with is Sophie's sexuality. These are progressive Gen Z people. Their politics check out, in the words of the film. But his politics check out. And that makes what happens next all the more fascinating because these supposedly tolerant people are about to become very intolerant towards one another and it really won't take much to bring it out. We are now entering spoiler territory. V, this is everyone. That's David, my best friend in the whole, whole, whole wide world. That's <laughs> Emma, that's Jordan, and... What's up? I'm Greg. What's up, player? I'm Sophie. These are the seven central characters, and the writing explores an immense array of tensions between them. There are romantic tensions. David, the host of this party, is in a relationship with Emma, an actress. Are you talking about us behind my back? No. Yes. No. Yes. This is Alice, an amateur podcaster who's in a relationship with a considerably older man called Greg. Alice, how long have you known Greg? Like, long. Our first date was a, was at a bar, he drank like a medium amount. Okay, Alice, he stop. likes nature. What is this? And this is Jordan. Of the seven, she's the only one who's currently single, but she seems to take a keen interest in Sophie's new relationship with B. Just be careful, okay? Miss Sophie, just be careful. Okay. Turns out that there is some romantic history between Jordan and Sophie, and Sophie will stop at nothing to keep it hidden from B. Does she know? Does she know what? That you begged me to stop at your apartment on my way up here. And I did. And we f in your car. There are also newcomer tensions. David, Emma, Jordan, Alice, and Sophie have known each other for a while. They're the core group even if Sophie's arrival is a surprise. I totally told you guys that I was coming. And I texted you. In the group chat? Yeah. No, you didn't. Whatever, you guys know that I'm useless with text, right? B and Greg are the plus ones. The group as a whole doesn't know much about them. And that makes them inevitable sources of suspicion when things start to go wrong. Your voice is trembling. No. Yeah. No, it is. I Googled you. And there was nobody with your name who graduated from Utah State this year. There's literally no record of your attendance at all. Listen, I can explain. There's tension between David and Greg, the two men in the group. David is the host, this is his party in his parents' mansion. He wants to maintain control, and something about Greg's effortless guru vibes is making him jealous. Oh, oh did you see that? It's not that that's crazy. crazy. He's not like that hot. You don't have to think he's attractive, only Alice has to think that he's attractive. Like, I feel like I'm more attractive than that. You do? Absolutely. So the opening act does a huge amount of work in establishing these characters and the relationships between them. Through efficient dialogue, we quickly get a sense of the pressure points. The stage is set, the storm is brewing outside, the descent into darkness has begun. 
He's watching a girl. Looks like he's having fun with Jordan. When Jordan starts to get a little too friendly with B for Sophie's liking, Sophie takes control of the party. Silence! Who wants to play bodies, bodies, bodies? So if you draw the piece of paper that has the X on it, you are the murderer. And you have to keep it a secret. I'm gonna hit the lights in a second. And if you're the murderer, you have to sneak around and kill someone by like touching them on the back. And then everyone else has to avoid being killed. And then if you are killed, you have to fall down and pretend you are dead. Like this. We're expecting something weird to happen. It is a horror film after all. If you do come across a body, you have to yell, bodies, bodies, bodies. And then once that happens, we'll turn all the lights back on and then we'll try to figure out who did it. Perhaps the house is haunted. Perhaps a masked killer will show up. But no. The horror will not come from beyond, but from within. These seven friends will unleash chaos upon themselves, by themselves. And that's what's smart about the film. It's a scarily plausible descent into darkness. Because as we've seen, the darkness is already present within the group. These characters are already willing to say nasty things to each other. And so external factors like the storm, the power cut, the drugs, those factors aren't responsible for the oncoming chaos. No, they simply draw out and amplify the hatred which these characters are already harbouring. We even get a sense that these characters are inviting the chaos to some degree. Guys, I get so stressed out every time we play this. Someone always ends up crying. Every single time we play, people start fighting. Yeah, well, that's what makes it fun, Emma. They know that whenever they play bodies, 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 it gets personal. And I think Sophie initiates the game for that very reason. There are elephants in the room, and she wants them to be acknowledged. This might be driven in part by a desire for honesty, but really, she wants to watch the others squirm. They've already pinned a lot of blame on her, and it's implied that she's not wanted at the party. It's time for their own shortcomings to be brought out into the open. Understandably, things really escalate when the group discovers David bleeding to death outside the house, his throat slit. So then it morphs into this kind of murder mystery. And at first, one of the suspects is Max, another friend who was at the house the night before. He confessed his love for Emma, David's girlfriend. Max told everybody that he was in love with Emma, which... David thought was beautiful in the moment, but maybe not today. Alice! And he punched David in the face. What the f happened to your face? Max. Max did that? Yes, Max, really, okay? I was standing outside and he just ran up to me and punched me in the eye. Just ran up to you. He just did. So there's a possible motive there, but little evidence to suggest that Max is a murderer. Max looked really angry at David. I'm serious, he looked like he was gonna do something really bad. Alice! I'm just saying. Shut up. Max would never. The next suspect is Greg. As the oldest member of the group, he seems to show maturity in taking himself away when David starts laying into him. You know, I think it's time for me to put myself to bed. Oh, come on, Greg. Greg. But David's death arouses all their suspicions about Greg leading to a confrontation in the gym. Greg is blissfully unaware of David's death, and he thinks the panicked state of the others is still part of the game. So he plays along, amplifying their concerns. It's like the boy who cried wolf. Greg can't take these people seriously in the one moment it really matters. In the ensuing struggle, B kills Greg with a kettlebell supposedly in self-defense. And tragically, it turns out that much of their suspicion was due to a simple misunderstanding. On paper, logically, he is the most likely to commit an act of violence. On paper? I mean, he's the only one who served in the military, right? So... What? He's a vet, right? Like, Iraq or... No, I thought it was Afghanistan. He was a veterinarian. Next to die is Emma, who falls down the stairs after receiving drugs from Sophie. But naturally, when they discover her body, the group continues to believe that a murderer is at large. Who was the killer in the game? It's following the same pattern. The deaths. Please, please, just stop talking, please. David, Greg, Emma. David, Greg, Emma. No, no, it's not 
following the same pattern. Greg died, and then we executed David. But in real life, David died, and then we... Okay, but Greg, David, Emma. I mean, why else would somebody leave her there unless they wanted us to find her? Why would they want us to find her? Because they're playing a second game! Things only continue to escalate as a gun belonging to David's dad enters the scene. A vicious argument transforms into physical struggle, culminating with Alice getting shot, Jordan getting hurled off the staircase, and B fleeing from Sophie. But then morning comes, the sun rises, the storm dissipates, and everything is revealed. Sophie and B are alone together once again, and the final scene draws all these threads together in a devastating way. B wants to check Sophie's phone to see if she really was having an affair with Jordan. Sophie promptly chucks the phone away, thereby confirming that she was. The pair scramble around in the dirt, tumbling into the pool, and the symbolism used here is almost reminiscent of Christian baptism. They are plunged down into the depths, rising up to live in the light of something new. Because when they emerge from the water, they discover that the phone now in their possession is not Sophie's, but David's. And what they find on it reframes everything. They use David's corpse to unlock the phone. And what do they see? A TikTok video showing David accidentally slitting his own throat while attempting to replicate Greg's trick with the champagne bottle. Thus, the entire film was a murder mystery without a murderer. These characters worked themselves into such a frenzy that only Sophie and Bee survived the night. There's something deeply depressing and futile about it all. Max shows up and notices David's body. He must realise that David is dead. He doesn't seem especially concerned or upset. Although he almost certainly will be upset when he discovers that Emma is dead too. At that moment, power returns to the house, activating the pool fountains. We hear dozens of messages arriving on the phones. What happened? I have reception. Yeah. And that's where it ends. I've been thinking about that final line, I have reception. Why does B say that? Is she simply deflecting Max's question and trying to fill the awkward silence with a mundane observation? Perhaps. But I think it's also an indication of how dependent we have become upon these devices. Losing reception almost feels like losing a body part. And so, when it returns, the relief is palpable. Phone use is the unspoken drug addiction of the movie. Throughout the storm, these characters are deprived of signal. And that contributes hugely to their restlessness. When the torch is the only feature on their phones that they can use, it feels like a safety net has been removed. Before, B was constantly on the phone to her mother. Alice was a podcaster. In his moment of jealousy, David retreated to his phone to try and prove himself in a TikTok video. This emphasis on digital life, combined with the social media catchphrases peppered throughout the film, has led many to treat it as a critique of Gen Z. I don't, you're always gaslighting me. Gaslight, shut up, it's a dumb word. Excuse me? Gaslight is like one of the most overused words ever to like the point of annihilation, okay? It doesn't mean anything. Other than the fact that, like, you read the internet, or like, congrats, you have a Twitter account. You are so toxic. I'm an ally. You are obsessed with playing the victim. And that's another familiar concept in our modern discourse. Competitive victimhood. Throughout the film, people are constantly trying to claim victim status. Your parents are upper middle class. No, they're not. Jordan. They are. They teach at a university. It's public. This is the game of competitive victimhood. To win the game, you need to prove that you have had things harder than the others. You need to show that you have suffered more. If you think about it, it's a strange phenomenon that we're having this kind of competition, because in ancient times, people didn't want to be seen as the victim. Victims are weak, right? But then Christianity came along, an earth-shattering proclamation about the Son of God voluntarily descending in self-sacrificial love to the agony of the cross, gaining the victory by becoming the victim. It's a radical inversion of power. Whether you believe it or not, our culture has been meditating on that vision for centuries, and it has profoundly shaped our view of the world. 
Look at this image and ask, where is the glory? The ancient Romans would have said that glory resides in the centurion, the one inflicting the violence. But now, in our post-Christian culture, we see glory in the one who's on the receiving end of the violence, the victim. That's a seismic shift. But in Bodies, 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 we see what happens when this idea gets divorced from its Christian roots. These characters still have a sense that there's glory in being the victim. They'd certainly rather be seen as victims than as oppressors. So they scramble to play the victim card even when it isn't theirs to play. And that's a phenomenon that we see expressed in a particular way among Gen Z. But what's uncomfortable is that the problems in this film are at root much older and much more universal. I'm talking about the human capacity to inflict harm on others simply through our words. Very often when we say something we regret, we'll follow it up with things like, that wasn't me, I don't know what came over me, or it was the alcohol talking, I didn't mean it. But those words that spew out of us, even the ones we really regret, they come from somewhere very deep and very old. It's part of human nature. Christians make sense of that through the story of Adam and Eve, the first representatives of humanity. Sin entered the world, and what did they do? They immediately used their words to blame and self-justify. And we have inherited that condition. And you see that in the film, do you not? The ease with which these characters tear into one another. Personal information that was shared in private when confiding with someone is all too easily wheeled out and weaponized. And these guys are meant to be friends. <laughs> None of these characters are willing to take the blame. Apart from B, she does admit to lying. My mom has borderline. I wanted to tell her, I just... I just really wanted you to like me. And Greg, as we've mentioned, shows some maturity in taking himself away from the conflict, although he doesn't help himself later. But otherwise, it's all about pointing the finger at others. It's total self-justification. In their minds, each of these characters are right. They won't own up and accept responsibility for wrongdoing. And therefore, there's no way that the conflict can be resolved. During the game, Jordan says this. It's Do we have any other nominations? Um, mm. yeah, David. Oh, come on, it's slow hanging fruit. I mean, he who cast the first stone. And this saying actually comes from the Bible. It's the moment where Jesus encountered a woman who was caught in adultery. She was about to be stoned to death by the teachers of the law and the Pharisees. But Jesus said, let any one of you who is without sin be the first to throw a stone at her. And one by one, the accusers walked away, leaving only Jesus and the woman. Jesus asked her, woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? No one, sir, she said. Then neither do I condemn you, Jesus declared. Go now and leave your life of sin. Jesus is the one human being without sin, the one person at the scene who's qualified to throw the stone. But he doesn't. He doesn't deny her wrongdoing, and yet he provides a way for her to be forgiven. And Christians believe that's what he accomplished on a cosmic scale on the cross, taking the full force of the judgment that we deserve. And whatever you make of this, it's a profoundly different vision to what we see the characters doing in the film. In a throwaway line, Jordan quotes the words of Jesus, perhaps without realizing it. I mean, he who cast the first stone. She then proceeds to join in with the game of stone throwing. Notice the dissonance there. So many of our impulses have been shaped by Christianity, including our desire for kindness and compassion. But in severing ourselves from the one who truly embodies these values, we have reverted back to just throwing stones. And forgiveness seems incredibly hard to come by. In many ways, this film depicts our world. We have been plunged down into darkness and confusion, largely of our own making. Our first impulse is to retreat to our devices, our sources of dopamine and escapism. Our second impulse is to blame everyone around us. But there must be more. Hello! 
Thomas here. You might enjoy a short film I directed called The Telltale Heart. It's based on the Edgar Allan Poe short story of the same name, and we had a lot of fun with it. Loads of practical effects and unhinged performances. And you can watch it by clicking here. I'd love to hear your thoughts. On this channel, I try to look at film from a different perspective, and sometimes I have a go at making films myself. Thank you so much for watching. Do subscribe if you'd like to stay in the loop, and I will be back soon. Goodbye.